Welcome to a very normal therapeutics employee training video. In this video, we'll be covering the chi-squared test. If you're a new employee of my made-up pharma company, then welcome. I'm Christian, and I'm your fictional guide for this training video. I'm a full-time biostatistics student, and the goal of this channel is to make you better at statistics. This series of training videos are designed to fortify your knowledge of standard statistical tasks. Just as a heads up, I do assume some light knowledge of statistics for these videos. You can refer back to previous training videos in this playlist. As a statistician of this company, you'll be expected to offer advice to other researchers in need of statistical advice. You never know what kinds of ideas or questions you might encounter as a consultant, so you have to be ready for anything. To emulate the process, I'll pose you a statistical problem, give you some relevant details, and let you think about a solution. The rest of the video explains a possible approach to the problem. Here it is. Our company has been developing a new drug to help people with migraines. If you've never heard of them, migraines are an intense headache that can be so bad that they can interfere with your daily activities. Our drug is designed to help stop a migraine as it's happening. Once a person takes our experimental drug, the migraine symptoms are supposed to disappear. If it does that, you would consider the drug to be successful at its job. This drug is almost ready for the market. What we want to do is to compare the effectiveness of our new drug against the placebo. You can assume that we can reliably recruit a lot of people to both groups in our future trial, and that everyone will be blinded to the drug that they'll be taking. Given all this information, what would you recommend for analyzing the data that will come out of the trial? Think about it a bit, and take some time to think about your solution. The details of the problem are here on the screen. What distinguishes this problem from past videos is the fact that our outcome is categorical. The migraine is either resolved or it's not. You can also think of this as a binary outcome. Binary data is really just a special case of categorical data, where the only two categories are true and false. General categorical data can have more than two categories. Another important feature of this problem is that we want to compare our migraine drug against the placebo. Comparison means that we're dealing with a two-sample problem, because we have two groups. Both the independent and dependent variables of our problem are categorical, so the analysis should properly take care of this. Finally, the last notable feature of this problem is that we have the luxury of being able to recruit a large number of people to the study. This means that we have access to hypothesis tests that require large sample sizes. Some of you may have thought of using a two-sample proportion test to approach the problem, and that would definitely be a valid approach. The two-sample proportion test is an application of the central limit theorem to categorical data, and it would be valid because we can assume a large sample size. But in a past video, we saw an application of the central limit theorem to the two-sample t-test. To teach you something new, we're going to go with an alternative but equivalent approach to the two-sample proportion test. We're going to use a contingency table and the chi-squared test to analyze our migraine data. A contingency table is just a convenient way to display categorical data. It's a table where both the rows and columns represent different categories of two categorical variables. It's usually customary that the thing we want to control will make up the rows, and the thing we want to see change will be the columns. Each cell of the table will be the number of people who fall into both the row and column categories. We'll denote each of these counts with small n's, with the subscript to denote the cell that they stand for. It's also typical to list out the totals for each column, row, and of the entire table itself. These totals are called the row and column margins, while the overall sample size is called the grand total. Since this is a clinical trial, the sample size for both groups are usually fixed ahead of time, so the row margins are fixed. What can vary are the counts within the cells. To be contingent on something is just an advanced way of saying you're dependent on something. We're hoping that migraine resolution is contingent on, aka dependent on, the treatment group. A contingency table is just a convenient, easy to read format for displaying data. It's the chi-squared test that gives us a way to use the data from a contingency table in a meaningful way. Let's dig into that. Like all the hypothesis tests we've covered so far, we'll break it down in terms of the Null Hypothesis Significance Testing Framework, or NHST. We'll look at the assumptions of the test, the parameters of interest, the null hypothesis, the test statistic, and the distribution for the statistic under the null hypothesis. First, we'll deal with the assumptions. We have to make the assumption that the categories are clear and mutually exclusive. This means that one person will contribute to exactly one cell in the table, 
Next, we're assuming that we can collect a random sample for both groups, which is another way of saying that we want our data to be independent. We can't have one person's outcome influence the outcome of someone else. Finally, the test assumes that we'll have a large sample size in both groups. This is needed to produce reliable results. Unfortunately, what exactly constitutes large doesn't always have a clear-cut answer. There are rules of thumb for judging what is large enough, but I'll come back to this in a bit when it becomes more relevant. The format of the contingency table makes it seem like we're interested in the counts within the table. That's actually not the case. For various reasons, it's not guaranteed that the migraine will go away, so we think of this event as being random and having some probability that it'll happen. This probability is our parameter of interest. To see the probabilities, we would need to divide the rows by the respective row margins. Each group will have their own probability of resolving the migraine. So you can also think of this probability as being conditioned on the treatment group. What we want to see is that people in the treatment group have a higher probability of their migraine stopping compared to the placebo group. By flipping this statement on its head, we can get a null hypothesis for this test. But here's another way to think about it. If you've worked with the chi-square test before, you may have heard it be referred to as the chi-square test of independence. From the perspective of independence, the null hypothesis is that the outcome is independent of treatment group. If the distribution of the outcome doesn't change, no matter what treatment group it's conditioned on, then these two variables are considered to be independent of each other. This is the literal definition of independence from a probability perspective. A contingency table just displays data. We need to construct a statistic based off the data in the table. For demonstration purposes, we'll use the following data to work through the hypothesis test. You can see that the treatment group has more people whose migraines go away, which is promising, but thanks to randomness, there's still a small chance that we can see data like this even when the two treatments work the same. It's not enough to work with our observed data alone. To do this, we need to create a second contingency table. And this table will represent what we expect to see if the null hypothesis is true. In our data, there are 100 people in both groups. Under the null hypothesis, both groups will have the same response rate, so by extension, we would expect the counts in each rows to look the same. It doesn't matter what the true response rate is, the fact that they're the same will produce the same counts. In fact, you actually don't need to know what the response rate is to calculate these expected counts. You can do it purely based on the margins. But you're not taking a midterm on this, so you don't need to know how to calculate it. We'll be using R to do it automatically. So we have two contingency tables one with the data we actually observed, and another with the counts we would expect under the null hypothesis. We're going to use the information from both tables to construct the test statistic. I'll use this first cell to start describing how we might do this. First, we take the difference between what we observed and what we expected, and then square the difference. I'll use this O to denote what we observed in the cell, and E to denote what we expected. To make sure that all the square differences are on a comparable scale, we also divide them by the expected counts. You may see in other resources that most of the expected counts should be greater than 5 to use the test. This is actually a reflection of the fact that the chi-square test requires a large sample size to produce reliable results. This calculation is just from one of the cells, so to use the entire contingency table, we calculate it for all the cells and sum it all together. In the end, we have the test statistic proposed by Carl Pearson when he first published about the chi-squared test. The last thing we need for the chi-squared test is the distribution of this test statistic under the null. This may come as a surprise to you, but this statistic has a chi-squared distribution. To understand why this is the case, let me rewrite the statistic with a small change. I've just taken the exponent and applied it to both the numerator and the denominator. For comparison, here's the test statistic for the one sample t test. When I was teaching the one sample t test, I showed you that the t statistic standardizes the sample mean. When we have to estimate the variance, the standardized mean has a t distribution, but when it's known, we have a standard normal. This is a direct consequence of the central limit theorem. If you compare the t statistic to the chi squared statistic, you'll see that it has a similar standardized form. You can also think of this statistic as a standard normal. I won't go over the technical details here, but here's a good paper for an interested viewer to look at. So the statistic is a sum of squared standard normals. The chi-squared distribution has a simple relationship to a standard normal. 
If you square a standard normal, then the resulting random variable is a chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom. Just like how the mean and variance are the parameters for the normal distribution, the degrees of freedom is the parameter for the chi-squared distribution. Different degrees of freedom will give the chi-squared distribution a different shape. When we sum multiple independent standard normals together, we still get a chi-squared distribution, but the degrees of freedom is related to the number of normals that we sum up. This independence matters a lot, especially since the data comes from a contingency table. Would you think that all of the standard normals from the chi-squared test statistic are independent? Remember that once the data is collected for our future clinical trial, both the results and sample size are fixed. This means that the different components of the sum are definitely not independent of each other. If I know how many people in the treatment group have their migraine resolved, then I can instantly determine how many people still had their migraine, since the group sizes were fixed. Similarly, I can also figure out how many people in the placebo group had their migraine resolved. The constraints of the contingency table reduce the degrees of freedom of the chi-squared distribution. In the end, the null distribution created by a 2x2 two two contingency table is a chi-squared distribution with only one degree of freedom, despite the fact that we're summing four squared normals. With that, we have all of the ingredients needed to conduct the hypothesis test. The function that implements the chi-squared test in R is the chi-squared dot test function. We'll use the data I showed earlier when walking through the test. It's easiest to supply the data in the form of a matrix, which better fits the form of a contingency table. To create the matrix, you use the matrix function. By default, the matrix function takes in a vector and builds the matrix by column. I like to build a matrix by rows, so I set the by row argument to true. Make sure you double check your matrix to make sure the data is organized in the way you want. Once the data is in matrix form, we can pass it to the test and look at the results. This x squared result represents the value of the chi-squared statistic. And like we discussed earlier, you can see it has a single degree of freedom. The p-value in this case is 0.15, so we actually fail to reject the null hypothesis on a 5% significance level. This was a video on the chi-squared test, a hypothesis test for categorical data. If you liked it and want to see more, then I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel. I also have a channel newsletter where I send my videos directly to your inbox when they go live. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one.